Everyone, welcome back to our continuing discussion of methods. This time we're on to part three, recording and stimulating neural activity. So as we have talked about in some detail at this point, axons produce action potentials, right? Big sweeping changes in electrical activity within that neuron. Terminal buttons elicit a postsynaptic potentials in the membrane of cells which can, uh, with which they form synapses, right? So we have little exchanges going back and forth of depolarization and hyperpolarization events. These electrical events can be recorded, right? As this is happening, we have not only changes in the um, ion concentration or the charge of the neurons themselves, but the environment, the electrical environment of the uh, extracellular fluid is changing as well as ions are moving in and out with neural activity. So changes in electrical activity of a particular region can be used to determine whether that region plays a role in various behavior. So um, we can record at various levels of electrical activity, right? We can get really, really specific and just record the activity of a single unit or just one neuron. Uh, we can record the population of multiple neurons in an area or a field. And we can even zoom out and look at larger trends in electrical activity. So um, one way that we can get recordings in animal work is similar to what we talked about with stereotaxic surgery, right? Electrodes, which are these basically wires with an uninsulated tip that's sensitive to changes in electrical activity, so it's electrodes that can measure changes in electrical activity, are implanted by a stereotaxic surgery to record activity of a particular brain region of an animal that is awake and free to move about. So we can actually install these in freely behaving animals and just sort of hook them up to a recording apparatus and then measure brain activity. So basically you have these electrodes that are driven down to the depth that's desired to target the regions that we're interested in measuring from. These are then are basically uh, attached to a connecting socket, which can then be sort of plugged in to the recording apparatus to record the changes that we're interested in. And this can take a number of different, as I mentioned before, single unit recordings are electrodes that are driven into a single neuron. Uh, LFP is local field potential. This is when we would place the recording electrode within the extracellular fluid. Um, basically, then we would just be getting aggregate information of all the population neurons in the area. We'd be able to detect big changes in the extracellular fluids ion composition as uh, these neurons go through firing waves of activity. Tetrodes are basically an array of these little microelectrodes, so just a, a collection of these that are sort of splayed out. And using information about sort of using the spatial location of each little tetrode wire and its relationship to the signals that are being received on each individual wire allows us to sort of triangulate the positions of individual single units. So while tetrode recordings aren't truly recording from a single cell, they allow us to reliably isolate single units and draw conclusions about single unit activity, um, but getting more than one at once, right? We have a multitude of single units that can be determined from tetrotype recordings. And this, again, isn't a super new technique. We've been able to record um, using electrodes for, for some time at varied levels of sophisticated... No, no, Elon, it's... I know it's a really cool probe that you've designed. It's, it's nice. Um, the wireless aspect's really good. It looks like development's coming along nicely, but you're a long way from curing autism. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We're just, we're not there yet. But it's, all right, next up is the electroencephalogram, or EEG. This is a method of measuring the electrical brain potential recorded by placing electrodes on the scalp, right? So this will record and amplify waves of electrical activity that sweep across the brain's surface. So in a similar fashion to the local field potential recordings that we talked about on the previous slide, these sensors will sort of pick up sweeping changes in activity uh, across the scalp. So it will record and amplify that faint activity and let us measure changes of populations of neurons. As this has great temporal precision, meaning that it's very, very time specific. You know that the neural events that you're recording are reliable, uh, you know exactly when they're happening. Very, very fine millisecond level precision, which is great. Um, it does have poor spatial precision, meaning that it's really hard to isolate exactly where the signal is coming from. Uh, you can get a pretty good idea of about what region it's arising from. You can localize it reliably to a portion of cortex, but you can't localize uh, single units by any means, right? You cannot isolate a single cell with an EEG net. 
but you can get a great idea of about, about where it's coming from. That precision improves with the more channels you have. So the more sensors that are placed on the scalp, the better the signal will be. A limitation that I want to mention with the EEG is it's limited to cortical structures, right? You have to measure cortex. You can't get signal from things that are below the cortex, so you can't measure like hippocampus or thalamus activity, right? Those structures are too deep. Um, we just can't measure the signals from those structures with the EEG. Oh yeah, so this picture is, is me from my grad school years. I'm serving as a, a subject to help Dr. Weil here collect some, some pilot data. And that was, a, that, was, that was a little while ago. Not too long. This is a really nice EEG setup. I think it's a 256 channel net. So each one of these little nodes is a basically an electrode sensor that uh, there's some conductive uh, medium. So some like salty conductive medium that my, uh, my head is kind of wet with. The net is soaked in it. Um, and each one of these little um, nodes is picking up signal from a specific region of my brain at that time. So this is the kind of data that you can get from EEG recordings. So this is data from a subject who is going through various states of um, sleep and wakefulness. This, of course, is really highly processed and smooth data. The raw data is a bit rough and harder to look at. But you can see here the, the um, awake subject has this sort of small amplitude, high frequency activity. Uh, as they are relaxed, they generate higher amplitude, um, lower frequency oscillations or uh, rhythmic firing. Um, Drowsy, we see slowed frequency and increased amplitude. As they are asleep, we see slower, higher amplitude waves. Deep sleep with even slower, even higher amplitude waves. And here we have a uh, brain activity of what someone in the coma light might look like with really uh, slowed, higher amplitude wave. Next up is positron emission tomography, or PET. Uh, in this uh, method, a patient is injected with radioactive uh, 2DG, which is radioactive, uh, essentially glucose. This is radioactive uh, glucose that really can't be metabolized, but it's taken up in the same way. So uh, as this radioactive um, glucose type molecule decays, it em uh, emits positrons in a reliable fashion, which can then be mapped onto the origins by a sensor. Uh, so then we can render a uh, sort of image of a slice of brain that is uh, imparted with this information, which will help us see the level of activity, something that would look a bit like this. This relies, like some other methods we're going to talk about, on um, basically looking at indirect metabolic activity. So the harder a brain region is working, the more um, energy it's going to use. And one form of energy that we use is glucose. So since this 2DG looks a lot like glucose, brain regions that are more active are going to take more of it up. And as this 2DG starts to degrade when it's taken up by those neurons, it's going to be sending out these positrons, which can be picked up by the sensor array. That can then be mapped back onto these little computer rendered slices. And basically what it tells us, the hot regions here are the regions that have a stronger signal, which means they're taking up more of this 2DG, which means they're working harder. So it's sort of an indirect metabolic uh, index of how hard a brain region is. So this provides us with some information on both structure and function. So oh, where is tissue and what is that tissue doing? Has pretty good spatial resolution. These arrays are good at mapping on where the origin of the positrons was, but pretty poor temporal resolution, right? It's a metabolic process, so we're looking at things that are delayed on optimistically on the order of seconds, whereas things like EEG operate on the order of milliseconds, very precise. MEG is magnetoencephalography which uh, allows us to detect groups of synchronously activated neurons by means of their magnetic field uh, that is changing based on their electrical life. So we have this array of really strong magnets that's able to uh, detect changes in magnetic fields produced by the electrical activity of these neurons. Like EEG, this has great temporal resolution, uh, but not so good spatial resolution. Um, and like EEG, it is limited to examining superficial structures, so you're limited to cortex with MEG you can't see below it. So fMRI, or functional magnetic resonance imaging, is similar to MRI in that it uses a big strong magnet to um, take advantage of the magnetic properties of certain elements of our brain. More specifically, fMRI measures blood flow as an index of brain activity, right? So areas of our brains that are working harder are using more oxygenated blood. So what we get is what's called a blood oxygen level dependent or bold signal. 
This measures, uh, these measures reveal what regions contain the most oxygen-rich blood over time. So this is a metabolic thing. Brain regions that are more active are using more oxygen. So if we can measure how much oxygen a brain region is using, we can infer that that region has been more active if it's using more. It says great spatial but poor temporal resolution, right? So we can see exactly like pixel perfect where these brain regions are using more oxygen. So it's really, really great with localizing it. But um, like some other methods, it has some slow temporal resolution, right? We're looking at the order of seconds um, rather than the order of milliseconds as we see with some other methods. However, it is better in both domains than PET scans. So I also want to mention briefly autoradiography. This relies on a similar mechanism to what we saw with uh, PET scans and that we're using a uh, sort of radioactive element to show us where things are localized. So we can take specific radioactive things that are going to bind to specific targets. So we could have radioactive ligands or radioactive glucose or something like that. Um, we let this auto, uh, this radioactive element bind to its uh, target of choice. Then we place it in a, uh, with a photographic emulsion or a piece of film that will cover the tissue. And then basically as this radioactive thing decays, we'll get a sort of shadow of where it was bound. So using autoradiography for an index of activity in, in a brain slice, like an animal brain slice like this, and exposing it to film, is an older technique that you wouldn't see very often. Um, a slightly more modern technique that you might still see is having a, a radioactive ligand, for example. So something that would bind to a specific receptor that you could then place into an emulsion or a, with a film and would show us where that receptor is primarily localized. There are cleaner and easier ways of, of getting that information now, primarily using things like immunocytochemistry and uh, fluorescence uh, work much faster and with more precision, but uh, I thought I should mention it as sort of like a historical perspective. Something else we can measure as an index of activity is what we call immediate early genes. So in response to stimulation, our neurons might have some of their genes become active, right? And these genes are going to become active and start producing protein. I don't want to get too into the weeds with talking about genetics here, but basically just because all of your cells have all of your DNA, it doesn't mean that they produce all of the proteins that your body is capable of producing all the time, because that would be a big disaster. But in response to certain situations, your neurons will start producing things that they are coded to be able to do. So in this instance, we take advantage of that fact that we know that certain types of stimulation will produce so sort of these epigenetic changes and will produce or change the level of a certain protein that's being produced. Using immunohistochemistry that we talked about earlier, we can label the presence of these immediate early genes. So for example, uh, FOS is an immediate early gene. It's a protein that's produced uh, sort of non-specifically in response to activity. So we can use uh, FOS as a sort of a readout of how active a brain region has been. If we see a lot of FOS protein has been produced, we can infer that that region has been very active recently, less FOS protein, less active. It might look something a bit like this. Over so in this instance, we have um, a stain from that's taken from a section of the uh, female rat amygdala. This rat has recently been involved in um, copulatory behavior. And uh, tissue is collected and stained for FOS. And we see all these little puncta here, these dark circles, are cells that are expressing elevated levels of FOS protein. So we can infer that this region has been more active recently. So going back a little bit to our cannulation methods that we discussed, we can produce electrical or chemical stimulation artificially. So electrical stimulation, it simply involves passing electrical current through a wire that's inserted into the brain. Because of the electrochemical nature of our neurons, this will cause uh, stimulation of those neurons, much like the first lab that we conducted online. Chemical stimulation can be accomplished by injecting a small amount of an excitatory neurotransmitter uh, such as uh, canic acid or glutamic acid into the brain. So a brief chemical stimulation. So I wanted to briefly mention the method of intracranial self-stimulation. Uh, so as we mentioned on the previous slide, we can drop an electrode into a specific brain region and then pass some current through it and cause that brain region to become stimulated. One application of this is uh, uh, dropping that electrode into a uh, part of the reward pathway. So that way when that electrode current passes through the electrode, it stimulates a reward center, right? And stimulation of this region is powerfully reinforcing. 
We can set up a situation where a, a rat is able to perform behaviors to receive stimulation of this reinforcement pathway, right? So then we might train a rat to press a lever just for electrical stimulation. And it might surprise you to learn that when we do that, it looks a bit like this. So you can see the rat is just cranking on this lever, right? It's following the light, pushing on the correct response. You might find that a little surprising, right? Like the, the rat's not getting anything. It's not getting any food, any water, anything that it really wants. All it's getting is stimulation of this reward pathway. And rats will work really, really hard for this, despite there being no real tangible physical reward. Just stimulation of reward centers. Okay, last up, we are talking about transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS. This uses a magnet to stimulate superficial brain regions. So stimulation of cerebral cortex using this, a magnetic field produced by passing pulses of electricity through a coil of wire placed next to the skull, right? So we have a really powerful magnet here that can be moved around. This can allow uh, exciting or interfering with various functions of a brain region. That sounds super dangerous, but it's relatively safe. Um, it's really interesting, right? It can stimulate or silence activity of superficial brain regions by passing a current through the coil here. Um, you can find some really dramatic demonstrations of TMS rendering people sort of unable to make coordinated movements of their hands by stimulating or inhibiting the motor cortex. Um, pretty cool stuff and a pretty exciting newer method. Okay, that's it for recording and stimulating neural activity. Uh, up next time, we're going to talk about some neurochemical methods.